Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of The Spotlight. I am your hostess, Gail Nicholson, um, making miracle queen, miracle making queen. I don't know. Um, we'll see. But uh, I want to welcome you for joining to for joining us today, and I want to um, welcome back a guest that I've had before, um, although not on the spotlight. He was a, a guest of mine in the Seven Figure Sunrise Summit. So what that means is that he is a self-made millionaire, and he happened to do it in uh, the realm of stock trading and stock trading education. So um, especially with what's been going on with the stock market and with um, social media doing its thing, uh, Reddit taking over the stock market for a couple of days last week and all of the chaos that's surrounding that. I'm very, very happy to have him on the show today to talk to you a little bit about what's happening and what to do with it. All right. So if you will, please help me welcome Mr. M. L. Singe, stock trading consultant at LiveTraders.com. Um, happens to be one of the top educational sites for stock trading for three years running now. Um, very, very happy to have you, Amal. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, so, uh, you know, like I alluded to a little bit in the introduction, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what Reddit did that sent the stock market into such a tizzy, who mm -hmm. it impacted, and how it's playing out um, as far as, because we know that uh, there were one or two apps like Robinhood that said, you know, th they restricted uh, buying at one point mm. and now they're in hot water because technically that's illegal. Um, mm -hmm. So please let me know what's your take on what happened with Reddit. Sure. So, I mean, what happened with Reddit is obviously very extraordinary. I mean, that goes to show when, and that's why, you know, you can't really tr trust professors or learn trading in college because that's not how the markets work, right? In college, they would teach you that markets are efficient, right? The efficient market hypothesis, everything you need to know about a stock is already priced in and you can't bet on the price of the stock. This completely shows that that's not the case. Markets are not efficient. There are inefficiencies in the markets where if you spot those inefficiencies, you can exploit those. And that's kind of what uh, the Reddit, you know, people on Wall Street bets, they actually ended up doing is it took advantage of that inefficiency, which was known as a short squeeze. Uh, so short squeeze typically happens when, you know, a big hedge fund or a group of traders bet against the stock and they want it to go down. So they borrow shares from somebody who has it, sells their shares, right? So that drives the prices lower. And the prices for GameStop, every nobody expected it to go up because, well, it's GameStop, right? They're going out of business. They're closing stores. Uh, there's nothing good to come out of it. It's not like a miracle turnaround of a business, it's GameStop. So everybody thought slowly it's just going to work its way down to zero. Uh, and that's why a lot of people were short that stock. And, uh, you know, Reddit folks, they spotted that inefficiency that, hey, it's a lot of people short in that. If we can just make it go up a little bit, they will have to cover. And now they have to buy back their short. So what happens is when those people are buying, they drive the prices higher. And now those people who were short that, they have to buy it back. So they have to buy it back even higher. So it created a short squeeze where everybody just had to keep buying it and that constantly drove the prices higher. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, usually what happened. Forgive me, but that sounds really, really complicated to me. How long does it take to before you actually get like an understanding of hedge funds and short selling and short squeezing and, and like literally making money off of business failing? Right. So, I mean, short squeeze is very, uh, it's been around for, you know, decades. It's always been around the markets. Uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, you can buy a stock, you can sell a stock. So shorting in a nutshell is very simple. It's basically when you buy a stock, you want it to go up to make money. When you short, it's just the opposite. You want it to go down and it goes down, it makes money. Think of it like you have hundred shares of Apple. Okay. At let's say a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Your friend thinks it's going to go down to 80. He says, Hey Gail, can I take your hundred shares for now? Can I just borrow it for a little bit? He takes your 100 shares, goes out and sells it in the market for $100. Stock goes down to 80. He buys it back and gives you back your 100 shares. So you get your 100 shares back, but he pocketed that difference between 100 to 80. So that's how, what shorting is. Uh, perfectly legal, and uh, I think it's perfectly fine to do. Uh, we do it all the time as traders as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that creates liquidity for, for the markets, right? There's always a seller. There's always a buyer. Uh, and that's, I think, very important for healthy markets to take place. Excellent. Excellent. So what's what's happening now as a result of that activity? Are people 
are there a lot of people like me that went, oh, well, maybe I could start to learn this now and start getting involved and downloading apps and playing around with a, a little bit of money to see how the game is played? Are there mm -hmm. a lot of people that are rushing to the market and, and getting into things? Yes, I think with this whole uh, thing that happened with GameStop and the Wall Street bets, uh, a lot of people that previously were not even into trading or had nothing to do with it, they see it on the news, they see it online, and and everybody's at home nowadays with the you know coronavirus. So they're looking for things to do, and people find their way into these online message boards and to see if they can follow the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I personally think that's a recipe for failure, and more people are going to lose money than make money. As you already saw with GameStop, mm -hmm. a lot of people still are holding those shares, and they've come back down from like 500 down to like $50. And eventually it's going to continue to go down back to zero because it, in the end it's GameStop, <laughs> you know, they're closing stores. They're going to, they're eventually going to go bankrupt. It's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when. So yes, more and more people are coming into trading. More and more people are downloading apps like Robinhood and stuff like that for trading. Mm -hmm. uh, but I personally feel that people should take it slow and learn it and learn it to do it the right way. There's no get rich quick in the markets. There was a little inefficiency that happened. The time has passed. And uh, I, I don't think that's a strategy to focus on for the long run. Awesome. Awesome. And that makes a lot of sense to me because mm -hmm. when I did get into it last week and then over the weekend, um, I saw an overall 75% increase in what I in invested, right? But I didn't know when to get out. I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to, you know, like what's going to happen to my money when I sell that stock? Does it just stay there and I can buy other stuff? Does it go back to my bank account? And this analysis and, and overthinking paralysis, I didn't sell when I could have. And I've, I've, I haven't lost my principal yet, but I've lost almost all my gains. Mm. So what is it that you need to look for? Um, when you do have a rally on a stock, whether it's what happened last week or in the future, um, indicators, you know, show that this is ready to t take off. Something is happening with the company. It's ready to take off. How do you um, recognize when to buy and when to sell? Uh, great question. I think that's really important because, you know, when you go on these message boards like Reddit, everybody will tell you when to buy, right? They'll be like, hey, you should buy this. You should buy this. You know, this is great stock. This is going up. Everybody will tell you when to buy. Why? Because they want you to buy. So that, it, you know, more and more people to buy. So it keeps going up. But nobody's ever going to tell you when to sell. And that's the problem that happened even with this Reddit people is that a lot of people had a lot of money they could have made on GameStop. You know, those Reddit people did have it right for a minute, for a couple of days. They did have it right. Stock shot up from 50 to 400, but now they're holding it back down to 50, uh, you know, and that's because nobody will tell you when to sell. That's something you have to make a decision on your own. And the way you do that is by defining before you even get into the trade. You're defining what is my exit point? What percentage gain am I satisfied with? So for example, you set a loss limit. Okay, if my position goes down 20%, I'm going to take my loss, walk away to the next stock. So that way you don't lose all your full money, you only lose 20%. On the upside, you could say, okay, if I make 60%, which is three times what I would have lost, right? Three times into 20. And if I get, if it goes up 60%, I'll take my profit there, right? So you do these kind of ratios. And if you're doing, let's say a three to one ratio, where every loss is 10%, every winner is 30%, you only need to be right on 30% of your trades. Think about that. So like you only need to be right, if you're right three out of 10 times, you're going to be a profitable trader. Right. And that's what most people don't understand. That's awesome. Yeah, because we always, you know, you hear in the news, you hear in the movies, all of these big money, huge gains and, you know, people driving around in fifth wheels. Oh, yeah, you know, we, we, we got into Apple early, you know, mm. that type of thing. Which brings me around to Tesla and what Tesla is doing right now. Mm. Um, because last week it was like at 43. Now, mind you, I'm kicking myself in the back, back because I got out of, or I, I did not, I got out of Tesla at 200, right? Tesla's at 800 right now. But it's not really Tesla, it's the one that I'm thinking of. Oh, it's Bitcoin that mm. Musk invested in, right? That was at 43,000 last week. Mm. Right. And I'm looking at something like that where it's like forty three thousand dollars for one share. I know I can do fractional share mm. shares through Robinhood. But if I got a measly little two hundred bucks, what would that do for me as far as getting into a forty three thousand dollar stock? And mm. then it's gone up. It's riding around fifty two thousand right now. 
-hmm. how would that have impacted my measly little two hundred dollars right i mean i think the great question you know because most people say oh look at bitcoin it went up from forty thousand to fifty thousand meanwhile you own let's say 0.5 0.05 bitcoin that basically means you made an extra ten dollars so you know <laughs> at that point it, it, it sounds great oh it went up from 40 to 50 but for most people that translates into 10 or 20 dollars in an extra profit so i think you know the thing people need to realize is that you will never get the top right you'll never get out at the right point you will never get in at the right point you're always going to be late you're always going to be early getting out that's just how the game works and you have to learn how to not have that FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Yeah. You, you, you learn how not to have it because it, it will always happen, right? You, nobody's perfect. Nobody has a crystal ball. And in fact, nobody knows where a thing is going. Everybody's just speculating. Uh, so what you have to do is, in the way I think about it is like, I would rather be out of a stock wishing I was in it than being in it wishing I was out. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something kind of I live by. It's like, I'd rather be out of it. Okay, I wish I was in Tesla. I wish I was in Bitcoin rather than being in something and I'm like, man, I should have gotten out. Why am I still holding? <laughs> you know, so you're never going to get the right exit. You just have to learn to live with it. And you just, you know, do the best you can. And, uh, you know, try and be satisfied with singles and doubles. Uh, there's no home runs. For every big winning story you hear on, on news, there's like hundreds of losing stories that you will never hear about. Yeah, yeah. And, and to carry that analogy a little bit further, you talk to any baseball manager and they'll tell you that it's the production line players that hit the doubles, hit, hit the singles, time after time after time that win the World Series ring. It's not the big hitters that, you know, yeah. you can count on them to do a, a home run every time they get up to bat, but if there's nobody on base, it's not a winning game. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you said, though, while you were answering that question brought to mind, it really is the percentages, isn't it? Because if you're, if you're putting $200 into a $43,000 stock, it's a percentage of, right, right that you got to look at your increases and such. Because you're not going to necessarily make a lot of profit, but mm. percentage-wise, is that the way to go? Is to, to pay more attention to the percentages on any given trade than than the money number? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, most people say, well, Bitcoin's going to $100,000. I'm like, well, if it does go to $100,000 from 50,000, that's a 100% increase. That's the same as a stock, $1 stock going to $2. Mm -hmm. What's the difference there? Right. There's no difference. It just sounds cool because Bitcoin went up so much. Yeah. But it's the same as a $10 stock going to 20, $1 stock going to two, mm -hmm. right? So there's no difference there. So yeah, percentages is what really matters. And I think a lot of people uh, hype you know, they fall for the hype things like GameStop, Bitcoin, focus yeah. on stuff that is boring that nobody's looking at because they're also going to be, they're going to be less volatile as well, right? Right. They're not going to go up from 400 down to 50 or like Bitcoin when it went up from 20,000, came back to 3000. That's not something I would ever want to invest in because like, you know, it's your money. It's your hard-earned money. What if it goes down one year, it takes three years to come back up. Mm -hmm. You would rather trade something boring that's slowly just kind of doing this. Right. Right. And that makes a, a good segue into the fact that there's different types of trading, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you're talking a lot about the long term, the stuff that's not too volatile, that just does a slowly plod up the mountain um, and that's less risky and more long term so that you actually build wealth. But there's a lot of other types of trading, too, isn't there? Um, like I've heard, uh, what is it called? Swing trading? What is that? Mm -hmm. Great. So swing trading is when you buy a stock and then you intend to hold it for at least a day. So you might hold the stock for three days, four days, maybe a week. So you're trading those swings when a stock goes from, let's say, 10 to 20, you're out. It comes back down to 15. Let's say we buy it, goes down to 25. So we're trading those little swings. We're holding it for a few days to a few weeks. Uh, that will be swing trading. And then there's day trading where you're getting in and out every single day. You're not holding it past that same day. And then there's long-term investing, which you might hold for a few months, few years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's three different types of tradings. Uh, and most people like they talk about, let's say Bitcoin or GameStop. Uh, I, I wouldn't classify that as a trading. That, that's speculation, right? That's yeah. basically you speculating on something, an outcome that might happen. So whenever there's an outcome that might happen, that's always speculation. That's not trading. Mm -hmm. uh, a trader will always have an entry price in mind an exit price in mind where he, he'll get out if he's wrong. Mm -hmm. So he's not just holding for the hope of it to come back up and you have an exit point on the way out. If you're right, when are you going to get out? So that's a trade when you have those three things, entry, exit point, and target point. 
Excellent. Excellent. Unless you're day trading in which it becomes clock points, right? You're in in the morning, you're out by bedtime. Oh, uh, no, happens. still. I mean, still they would have their entries as well. So like this morning mm -hmm. I was uh, betting against PayPal. So I was shorting PayPal and I, I shorted it at, let's say, $290, right? Mm -hmm. And then my exit point was if it goes up to $292, I'm going to take my loss and I'm going to walk away, right? Or if it drops to $280, you know, I'll take my profit and I'll walk away. So, you know, that's kind of, so you still have those points. You always need to have an exit point when you're wrong because if, because if you base it, let's say on a time, something like, okay, I'll get out by 12 o'clock. What if it just keeps going up by 12 o'clock? You're losing money. You know, you have to be able to cut your losses quick. And that's where we get into that emotional attachment, right? Hmm. And that's, that's no way to make money. And, and it's kind, kind of um, oxymoronic because money is very emotional. I mean... You know, joy follows money. Depression spirals downward when there's no money. That type of thing. I mean, it's it's emotionally attached. Did it take you long to develop the um, disattached? Okay, this is when I go in. This is when I go out. Even if it's looking good, I'm still out. Right? Hmm. Is right. that difficult for you? Uh, yes, it was definitely very hard. That was that's the, I would say that's the hardest thing about trading is to be detaching yourself from the outcome and like detaching your emotions from what's the, what the stock is doing and you simply following your plan. That is literally the hardest part about trading. Like if people can just master their emotions and the discipline, mm -hmm. that is all you need to know. Like nothing else is really required for trading until that. So that took me a while. I mean, it took me a good two, three, four years to really build that mental muscle to be able to say, I'm just going to hold it until it either hits my target or it hits my stop loss. And I'm not going to touch it in between. So yeah, that's, that, that's the hardest part in trading. That's I think the difference maker between people who make it in this industry and don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, maybe it's a quality that doesn't serve you well in relationships, but it definitely <laughs> helps you out in uh, trading. Right. Yeah. Right. You gotta, you gotta compartmentalize <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the disattached logistic logistician at work. Mm -hmm and the passionate partner at home. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you about this. I know you've got a, a, a new program out. I don't know if it's new. I just saw it yesterday. One of the programs that you offer for education that is mm -hmm. specifically for day trading. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. What can somebody expect? Because I know it, day trading sounds really mm. exciting and there's a lot of possibility for making some really good um, money if you do it right. Um, but again, the risk is really high and there's a really good possibility for losing a lot if you don't do it right. So tell us a little bit about what is in that and what you're providing to people to, to teach them how to do day trading the right way. Great. So, you know, our main course that we have is like the PTS professional trading strategies course. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the, we call it the Bible for traders. It's literally 600 pages, A to Z, all anybody needs to know about anything trading, day trading, swing trading, long-term trading. And then I, after that course, I developed a, a day trading strategy course that I taught, which is a roughly about, you know, seven hours of training, uh, video training. And that was specifically designed for people to learn how to master the first hour of trading, which is the market open from 9.30 a.m. till 10.30 a.m. That's my speciality. I don't trade the markets all day. I, I will come into my desk at nine o'clock. I will make a list of stocks that I might want to trade. 9.30, the market opens, and I'm usually done trading by 10.45. The first hour is where I focus on, and that's my speciality. So after 11 o'clock, I don't trade the rest of the day. Um, so that's kind of my speciality. And that's, that's what I taught in the course is that framework of how to trade the first hour, mm -hmm. like what to look for, what patterns to look for, where you're going to get in, where you're going to get out, and uh, you know all the tools that anybody might need to trade that first hour of power, as we call it. Very cool. I had no idea that there was a strategy that like that to to go in, do your stuff first thing, and then leave it alone for the rest of the day. Yeah, um, my partner, like he's in Arizona, so for him, he wakes up uh, six in the morning because you know different time zone. So by the time he's done trading by like, let's say eight or 9 a.m. his time, most people are waking up to go to work, which is great. No, well, he's got the golf course all to himself. I mean, yep. <laughs> that's yep. awesome. him and the Canadians. Yes. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, so do you have any um, memorable trades that 
either you made bank on, like that was out an, an outlier of everything that you've ever like been profitable with, or mm. even the other side of the coin being, um, you know, any memorable trades that you just took a bath on. Right. Sure. So, I mean, you, for, for the most part, I'm a very like disciplined trader, meaning like I wouldn't really have massive gains or massive losses. All my winners are exactly the same, all, uh, you know, dollar amount, all my losers are exactly the same. So when I'm day trading, if I lose a thousand dollars on the trade, I'm out automatically. So all my losers by that measure will always be a thousand. I'm never going to have a big loser. And on the winning side, as soon as they go up, let's say $3,000 profit, which is three to one, mm -hmm. I will get out so that, that way I will never have big winners uh, as well. It's always the same. But recently I had, you know, the best trade I had when 2021 was in the, on the marijuana stocks. So, you know, I've been watching the marijuana stocks for many, many years. And then uh, obviously Trump lost the election. So Democrats uh, controlled, you know, the presidency. They already had the House and then they were going to win the Senate. Right. Because uh, the same million things that were happening. So the uh, they were going to win that as well. So I kind of thought, OK, if the Democrats are going to win both Senate and the House and the presidency, it's very easy for them to pass any laws through. And we already know they talked about legalizing marijuana. So I kind of predicted that and I bought a bunch of marijuana and cannabis stocks in that sector. And then they won the Senate. And then, you know, a lot of states uh, legalized it. A lot of uh, in New Jersey, Arizona, a lot of states legalized it. So the marijuana stocks went up like, you know, a thousand percent. And then, so that's kind of where I profited most of majority of my this year's profit came from just the cannabis sector. Nice, nice. Um, now, would you consider those now that we've gotten to where we've gotten federally with it? Um, would you consider those long term stocks now? Absolutely. Good buys. Good, yeah. good to get into. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of because it's, it's still very it's a very early industry at the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And anytime there's an early industry, there's always consolidation. So let's say there's 50 different small marijuana companies. Over time, there's going to be five that are going to become really big. And then those five are going to start buying out those smaller companies to make like five, let's say, bigger companies. So from 50 smaller companies, they will emerge like five big companies uh, when they start merging together and, you know, acquiring other smaller companies. So, yes, I think marijuana sector long term is still very early. It's almost like getting into, um, you know, there was a stock called MO, uh, Altria, what used to make cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's almost like investing in that in a very early stage, investing in alcohol company in a very early stage. So yes, I do believe uh, that marijuana long-term is a, a good you know, bet. Awesome, awesome stuff. Good for me to know, because I got at least three of them now. Great. <laughs> um, but what other ones, what other industries or sectors, I know that you look for disruptive technology companies. Now, what does that mean? So, I mean, disruptive, uh, you know, when I'm investing in early stage companies, which are, those are you typically not public companies or the private companies like angel investments. So yes, in that I'm looking for things that could, you know, disrupt something or they're either new or they're innovating at a different level. Uh, so that, that's more in the private sector. In the public sector right now, I mean, I'm focusing on marijuana, I'm focusing on gaming stocks, uh, meaning like those betting stocks, because even betting is being legalized in different parts of the United States. A lot of, uh, you know, the legislature is already there with the states and it's just about to get passed. So that's another thing I'm obviously in at the moment is gaming, betting stocks. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, anything in the energy sector? I mean, should how how are we looking as far as the green future and all of these solar and green companies out there? Um, you know, with what's happened in Texas this week, mm. um, they're using that to color the the green industry as. Uh, unpredictable and untrustworthy. So should we believe right. that or should we just kind of lay low with our green stocks and go, it's coming back? I think, uh, you know, solar is the only like, you know, one that has potential, right? Like okay. wind, as you saw in Texas, you know, it's, it's hard because it just froze and they're not moving. So if you were had an economy, let's say, reliant, not on fossil or gas, but let's say purely on wind turbines, they froze, they stopped moving. So that's a scary thought have in the future where the world just has wind turbines and there is no uh, let's say there is no sun you know it's snowing there's no sun solar is not working that's a scary thought so it is unreliable it's very early yeah. same way when people were talking about marijuana companies four years ago it was very early we were not there yet now we are the so same thing it'll slowly come around but i think it's very early still to invest in renewable energy uh it's uh, you know it's it's unpredictable at the moment 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Are there any, um, anything that you would, or like, like if you had three top stop, top stock picks that you could say, this is, this is something that I think is going to pay off in the next two months. Mm-hmm. What would those be? Two months. That's a, that's a harder one, but I would say, uh, E L Y S is a gaming stock. You okay. know, that's a betting company. So that recently started get a move going and, uh, it currently trades around six or seven dollars. Uh, that probably I think going to be over ten okay. soon. But ELYS is one uh, I personally, uh, you know, full disclosure, I do have shares of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the two months, I think that is one that I like. Um, the other one I like Y E L L. Y E L L. Yeah, Yell. It's a transportation railroad kind of a stock. So recently, you know, we noticed that there's some big institutions or companies that started kind of buying the stock up. So you know, they might know something. And uh, even technically, it looks good. So again, it's trading at $6 right now. I think probably will be around $10. So those are, I would say, the two that I personally own and I feel good about. Um, but everybody you know, should do their own due diligence. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is not any recommendation or advice. <laughs> yes, yes. We want to make sure the disclaimers are definitely in there. Um, so one of the things that I was looking at um, and trying to think that I actually know something a week in um, <laughs> is I was looking at a company that does um, transportation out of Hong Kong, you know, shipping things. And it has not, it seems like it hasn't been doing very well. It's been going down and, and flatlining. Um, but the analyst stuff says buy, 100% buy. So mm-hmm. I bought some and it's not doing a whole lot. It's not moving around. But what up, my thought was is when we open up from the pandemic, there's going to be a lot of shipping. There's going to be a lot of bringing products back to market that are, you know, our shelves are pretty empty right now. Is right. that the right kind of projecting mindset that you want to have when you're looking for a stock? Like what might be happening in the next few months that could make this viable? better um, I, I think the right way to do it like if anybody wants to do it professionally it's purely you should do it on technicals so you have to learn a little bit mm-hmm. about how the charts look the markets look and making decision uh based upon the chart like the analysts are very hard to trust because you know they usually they have hidden agendas let's say their clients own the stock they just want people to buy so they put up a buy rating and they're, they're usually very late so as the stock has already gone up then they're like okay buy rating and then as the stock starts to go down, it's already going down. Then they're like sell rating. So I, I don't trust analysts. Uh, again, most analysts don't even trade themselves. Their job is just to push buy and sell ratings. And usually they have a hidden agenda behind it. Um, so I don't trust uh, analysts at all. Good to know. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much. I, I want to take a moment to say thank you very, very much for being with us today. I've learned a lot. I hope that our audience has as well. Do you have any um, final two bits for our viewers to watch or to listen to? Sure. I think, uh, you know, if anybody else is interested, um, you know, in trading, uh, I would say take it slow. Don't fall into the hype. Uh, don't fall into going on Reddit. Uh, most people on Reddit are not traders. They're usually, uh, you know, video game, uh, video gamers that are just on a message board talking about stocks. Uh, and that's not professional research. And uh, for every winning story you hear, there's hundred losing stories that you will never hear about. So take it slow, take it easy. Uh, don't fall for the hype, uh, you know, create a process behind your investing and trading decisions. And in the end, follow your own judgment, follow your own advice and try not to listen to other people because if the analyst knew something, then we would know their names. We don't. <laughs> good point. We don't know their names so, because they, they're probably not good enough. If they were, they would be Warren Buffett or they would be somebody else. So, you know, you have to uh, learn to make your own decisions and just learn to do it the right way. And again, we're always here at Live Traders to help you guys out if you're interested. Uh, and you can, you know, read tons of blog posts on our site, call our team, speak to somebody, and see if this is something you should even get into. Oh, yes. And I want to mention, too, the 60 Second Success Show on Anmal's YouTube channel. Tons of videos with really, really amazing content. So definitely go check that out as well. Thank you again, Amal, for being with me today. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in once again. Um, Have a fantastic week and take care. Bye now. Thank you. When you open yourself up to actual energy work, makes that recovery progress so much faster. That recovery is possible. You do not have to live as a victim until your last days. You have 
unbelievable strength, and I know that because you're still here. Do you want to create something completely unrecognizable with your life? I can show you how.